Please. All right, settle down, please. Boo. 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 Anybody? Everybody? Welcome to the September meeting of the new Sheridan Club, or should I say? Yes. Well, we'll, we'll finish the meeting in the normal style with a rousing chorus of rural Britannia. <laughs> couple of announcements. The online quiz nights taking place 9th and 16th of September via Zoom, via Facebook as usual. 13th of September during the day, Luke has kindly organised um, his pucker picnic. And um, the next meeting will be the 7th of October back here. And Luca will be talking on... Are you talking? What? Yes. A speech entitled What's So Great About Art Deco? Have well, you forgotten now? <laughs> <laughs> it's just ready. It's got to arrive. ready for six months. Okay, and just welcome tonight's speaker, Earl of Essex. Who will be... Yay! 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 Yes. <laughs> we'll be talking about the Riviera, the Forgotten War. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Tell a few jokes. Yes. Is there a link? That's good. Okay, female zebra escapes from a from a circus, it's galloping through the fields and uh, sees a stallion. And the stallion says, Oh, what do you do? And she says, Oh, I, I work in a circus. The female zebra says to the stallion, oh, what what do you do? The stallion says, get those pyjamas off, girl, and I'll show you. Ready, <laughs> Essex? <laughs> anyway, Earl of Essex, thank you. Yay! Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to your share and cup. It's good to be back. Everything's back to normal. My name's Bill. Thank you. Good night. Short but sweet. Any questions? Any Nazis in the house tonight? Any Nazis in the house tonight? Don't forget your script, Essex. It's a top Yes. Thank you. Uh, but in all seriousness, I would like to say a few short words before I begin um, on this auspicious occasion. Some of you will know that the new Sheridan Club began in October 2006, risen from the ashes from the Chuck Magazine Sheridan Club that met in this very same room. The NSC was established because Sheridan Club members enjoyed meeting once a month, and so it is appropriate that after six months' absence, we celebrate our return to the wheat sheaf. So I would like you to raise your glasses to New Sharing Club and David and his team at the Wheat Sheaf who have yes. made this all yeah. possible. Yeah. 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 Okay. Eyes down for full house. Uh, one does do not need to travel far in the French Riviera. Sorry, mate. This one, isn't it? It's the right button to go for it. Okay. Oh, thank you. You're working. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I often uh, just take the uh, battery protector, yes. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, well, no, it does not need to travel far on, on the French Riviera. There we have it. I'm business. I'm business. I'm business. Nazi will spand you're right. <laughs> You've got no props there, eh? Right? You can't find my props. Whenever you want to find what props you can't find. 
Anyway, <coughs> there we have our first night of the evening. This is um, the uh, Boulevard des Anglais on the Nice, uh, nice shoreline. Well, I don't need to travel far in the French Riviera, the 120 mile um, coastline that meanders northeastward from the rocks of the Estorel Heights in the west to the Italian border at Monton on the east to be reminded of the fact that between the autumn of 1939 and the summer of 1945 this was a rampageous battle zone. In every town and village on the way, street plaques, mem memorials and um, crumbling fortifications bear witness to the, the, the hard fought, the conflicts and hardships that the, took place and yet the modern perception that this area of France quietly sat out the war under the glorious weather of the Côte d'Azur. Nothing could be further from the truth. Much of the regret of the region's war experience can be attributed to the French themselves, who largely wished to forget this black period in their nationals, in their nation's history, due to the, uh, uh, the guilt associated when French members set against each other under the despotic rule of their own Vichy regime and more latterly Italian and German direct occupation. But during the 1920s and early 30s, the French area developed as a tourist destination. This is the uh, <coughs> same Avenue des Anglais in Nice, seen in the 30s. Uh, the French area developed as a tourist destination and a place to, to live for rich Americans, Jay Gould, the, the industrialist and philanthropist, a lamprophist together with his third wife, Florence. That's them. That's Jay Gould, that's Florence. Charlie. And you might recognise that as Charlie Chaplin. Now, they actually had an open marriage. <laughs> so, uh, Charlie Chaplin was her lover as well. But we're not going to go into their story. They, you could actually write, well, there is a book about her anyway. <laughs> you could go into it a lot, a lot deeper. But basically, they moved to South France and developed several. Um, uh, as casinos and hotels in the French Riviera, settling in Jean Le Pen. Uh, Jay Gould was a descendant of the, um, <coughs> one of the main developers of um, American railroads and was immensely wealthy. Um, and that's them, um, that's Jay Gould, that's France, and that person in the middle there is the mayor of Nice. So they were very well connected. And those are fashionable people, probably in the late 20s, but anyway, it gives an idea of how people dressed during that period and relaxed in the south of France. And Gerald and Sarah Murphy, wealthy American expatriates from a family that owned five fine leather goods company, attracted the likes of Cole Porter, Ernest Hemingway, Scott and Zelda Fitzgerald, and Pablo Picasso to the Villa uh, America on Cap Dantide. Many tourists became acquainted with the area through, the area through, initial, through an initial visit to Cannes, five miles further west along the coast. And the eruption of war in Europe could not have gone at the worst time for Cannes. The British deserted in early 1940, high fashion shops among the Rue, Rue Dantide closed and luxury automobiles remained in shop windows. The showpiece hotels, the Carlton, Majestic, Martinez and Miramar were largely empty. Cannes was the second largest city in, in the Alp Maritime, with a population of 49,000, and royalty from Maharajas to kings and princes visited with regularity, and aristocrats, aristocrats like the Rothschilds were in evidence. The crowning achievement was to be a film festival scheduled in scheduled uh, to begin in September 1939, during the summer of Galaxy of Film Stars, Charles Boyer, Carrie Cooper, Tyrone Power, George Raff, Norma Shearer and Mary May West came to uh, promote the inauguration during the summer. Everything was ready for the opening night, and then Germany invaded Poland. Nice, the city of flowers, was the fourth largest city in France in 1940. The name derived from the hillsides of green houses providing blossoms and for establishments to make the essence of perfume in nearby grass. Nice was a de facto capital of the French Riviera 
if with no government, <coughs> governmental significance. And that is the casino in Monaco, Monte Carlo, 1930. So um, it was uh, pretty much business as usual during the 30s. 25 miles southwest of Canberra is the sleeping port of San Tropez. It was the first town to be liberated by the Allies, albeit as a, as a result of a mistake by them during the invasion of Provence. It had prospered by trading fish, caught wine, and, and wood, but by the 20th century it was better known by the artists Signac, Matisse, and Bernard, who painted its colourful waterfront. Waterfront. Marseille, 100 miles west of Nice, and uh, birthplace of France's national anthem, was prized for its port, largest in France. As such, its retention was vitally important to the succession of powers controlling the media during the war, the Vichy regime, the Italians, the Germans, and finally the Allies. When the, whilst the Riviera was not the scene of armies clashing on the battlefields, the capitulation of France in 1940 to Germany nevertheless produced a kaleidoscope of hardships without equivalent elsewhere in Europe. Few areas around the world experienced domination by more than one totalitarian regime. The inhabitants of the area suffered under Italian fascism, German Nazism, but more significantly under the German puppet regime of Vichy France, which set Frenchmen against Frenchmen. The reality of World War II began with the Riviera defending itself against the Italian army in June 1940, and finally ended with the Allied invasion in April 45 a period up, uh, longer than any other part of France. After Germany invaded Poland on 1st September 1939, crushing the Polish army within eight days, the phony war began in earnest on the French Riviera. I think you might recognise that as <laughs> Signor Mussolini. Requisitions were issued for lodging and transportation, horses and, and, and mules, Educational institutions, hotels, cinemas, and uh, sports facilities were commandeered for the emergency. The Palm Beach Casino at Cannes was turned into a hospital, and people covered their lights of their houses at night. The street lights were extinguished, um, were extinguished, caught. Can't read that. <laughs> Sorry. Car right. I beg your pardon, my writing is terrible. Card to identity were issued at police stations and municipal uh, governments installed and tested air raid sirens. Belligerent outbursts on the radio by Hitler and Mussolini during the summer and autumn were listened to somberly. At first, military authorities mobilised and, and, and uh, stationed between 75 and 90,000 soldiers in the Alp Maritime region in a command soon named the Armée des Alpes. But as the threat to northern France became more ominous, the best of these units were redeployed there, leaving a waiting army, ill-equipped and short of everything. At first, these, mass, these uh, wartime restrictions were taken in good heart, but after two months of no major hostilities, the mood soon turned to resigned indifference, and the authorities gra gradually loosened the reins. On May 10th, 1940, the German army attacked... Uh, Westward, 136 German divisions swept across the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, and into France, the French recoiling under the weight of the onslaught. Nighttime lighting returned to blackout rules on the Riviera, and casinos closed their doors. But largely the attitude of the local populace remained optimistic, despite deposit depositors removing their savings from banks and a steady influx of refugees from the north. When May became June, the situation north of Paris had escalated. Belgium surrendered on May 28th, and Lille fell on May 31st. German Heinkels and Junkers bombed Marseille on June the 1st, and, uh, on, on its, and on June the 10th, the French government fled from Paris to the Loire Valley, and, and on June the 14th, the Germans entered France, entered Paris rather. The phony war on the French-Italian border ended in the early morning of June 11th when French 15th Corps engineers demolished critical military infrastructure, bridges, tunnels, viaducts, 
section of roadways and telephone um, grids. Popular distrust of Italians had grown as Mussolini's diatribes became more vitriolic in the, late, in the days leading up to his declaration of war. However, Mussolini had given orders to his commanders to remain on the defensive, taking no initiative and encourage, encouraging only, engaging only in surveillance. A commentator rightly observed that for the first time in history, a war had begun with the order not to fire. This reluctance came to an end when a French naval squadron bombarded Genoa on June the 14th. They followed the first Italian air attacks on military targets along the Côte d'Azur, and on the same day, the French government moved further south to Bordeaux, and three days later, the new head of the French government, Marshal Philippe Patin, sued for peace. That's Patin in the middle. And that's Pierre de Val, who became his uh, Prime Minister. Let's go back a bit. In 1940, the Italian frontier in southeastern France ascended through the foothills north, north of 25 miles of sea until reaching the high Alps, where it turned west, northwest, and then north again. The southernmost fortifications of the Maginot Line closely traced the border up to the highest elevations, where they were, they were spotted at wider intervals with a combination of forts, blockhouses, trenches and tunnels. So it was well fortified by the French. Although the media had sent their best troops to the German front, the French 15th Corps, um, totaling some 170,000 men, were up against 4,000 Italian troops. They then began a farcical two-week war the conflict evolved into a series of local skirmishes along the border, but no coordinated offensive. That's Italian troops moving through the Alps. That's them chasing through the Alps again. The Italians had air support, but did little to take advantage of it. French defenders who came under um, artillery attack from the Italians noted that as many um, as half the shells failed to explode. June 23rd and 24th were the only days of heavy fighting in the southeast in what was sarcastically described as a gelato war, for it took little more time than required to eat an ice cream cone. <laughs> a heavy engagement took place in and around Monton, and Mussolini was determined to ruin the city of Citrons too. Uh, what he saw as its rifle replacement in Italy. Uh, that's Italian troops again in the Alps. Yes, please. Would you mind going back? <laughs> yeah. Under the camera. You're wandering further and further out. Oh, right. Oh, right. <laughs> so, uh, this is Italian troops for tourism. Mont Montal is very significant to the Italians. They regarded it. It had always been a dispute between the French and the Italians. And as far as Mussolini was concerned, he wanted it back under Italian rule. Uh, yeah, a uh, heavy engagement took place in and around Montons. Mussolini was determined to run the city of Citrons to what he considered its rival place within the Italian nation. Otherwise, the Italians succeeded in only advancing one to five kilometres beyond the frontier, occupying 840 square kilometres with a population of 28,000 inhabitants. The Italians failed to overcome a single fortification manned by French troops, and a downtrodden French army did up, took pride in its defence and refused to recognise the Italians as their conquerors. The feat ceasefire began soon after, for, uh, after midnight on June 25th with the French government ceding this territory to the Italians. They weren't particularly interested in uh, fighting over it, and the government under Patan, preferring to preserve its air and naval assets, considered more important than this territory in the far corner of France. Casualties in the outmarching during this short conflict amounted to 13 Frenchmen killed, 42 wounded and 33 Italians taken prisoner, sorry 33 Frenchmen taken prisoner, while the Italians suffered 208 dead, 941 injured and 131 lost to, as prisoners. So the French would rightly claim that they hadn't really lost this uh, particular skirmish with the Italians and on Monday June 20, sorry, June 17, 1940, 
84-year-old Marshal Philippe Patin, the former French World War I hero, announced that at the request of the President of the Republic, he had uh, taken leadership of the government of France. He concluded that it was imperative to stop fighting the Germans. And so that's Patin with the vowel. That's Patin meeting Hitler. And that is Patin meeting Reich Marshal uh, Goering. Now, the important thing to consider here is, although we think of Goering as the head of the Luftwaffe, he was also at this time the head of the, of the Gestapo, the uh, uh, secret German secret, Nazi secret police. And this is, you know, will become more significant later on. So on Monday, do some, anyway, a vast majority of the French were relieved by Patin's decision to concede to the invaders. At this point in time, Hitler's eventual triumph over Britain seemed certain, and the control of Western Europe would be complete. And after some faltering steps, Patin's government settled into Vichy, a town of 25,000 residents dating back to Roman times, best known for its mineral waters. It had spacious hotels to accommodate. Uh, convalescing, uh, those convalescing uh, drawn to the bars, and also suitable for administrators, uh, ministers who had seen a foreign di Oh, God. <laughs> I should ignore that. <laughs> Can't make sense of that. On July the 10th, the Third Republic was abolished and Patan designated the Hezard State. The armistice signed on June 7th by the French came to take from midnight on June 25th. It divided France into occupied and non-occupied zones. And as you can see, that is the German occupied zone. And this is the so-called free French zone um, run by the Vichy regime on behalf of the Germans. And this is the Italian sector. Uh, which they had won during the conflict with the Southern French Army. Although the Southern Zone referred to as the Free Zone, it was still subject to censorship of mail, interception of telegrams and monitoring of telephone conversations. Newspapers were subject to similar scrutiny. German agents circulated on the Côte d'Azur during the Vichy period and the Gestapo soon established space to us assist French police in arresting anti-Nazis. The residents of the Outmarrow team were puzzled by the capitulation and considering that their army of three divisions had not been defeated by 32 <coughs> Italian divisions, they had a point. But like the rest of France, they fell into line, lauding Pétain, the prevailing slogan became, with the Marshal or against France. And at this stage, I'm going to sit down, is that okay? You're out of the lights anyway, so... Right. <laughs> Not so well. That's better, actually. Good. I'm sorry, I'm not... Patan used the term Revolution Nationale to encompass his programme to rebuild the, the good France, as he saw it, a strong centralised state with concentrated capitalism and Catholic moral order. This demand to derive either of patriotism and traditionalism, traditionalism and, its, its, and in its wake, 15,000 naturalised citizens had the status revoked, including 6,000 Jews. So <clears throat> his idea of nationalism was really uh, similar along the lines to the, the uh, Nazi regime. German demands for heavy reparations, followed by representations of French goods, services and manpower required the Vichy regime to subject the country to a stringent and centrally controlled war economy, essentially doing the Germans dirty work for them. I mean, the Germans, in a nutshell, didn't really want to occupy the whole of uh, France. They regarded the south of France, although it produced food, as less important uh, to their whole structure as the north, and it would stretch their resources to. Man. So they're happy to uh, allow the Vichy regime to do their work for them. Fashion designers, writers, musicians and film stars took refuge on the Côte d'Azur during the twilight period. Although rationing tightened as a month spent by, there was a thriving black market for those who could still afford to pay. 
for the not so fortunate, uh, dogs were killed or released in the wild to conserve food. You know, despite these shortages, starvation in France never reached the same extreme scene in the Soviet Union, Poland, Holland or Greece. The, um, the, the longer Bataan, the Bataan, Bataan government stayed in power, the more criticism mounted and his image became tarnished. There were no serious problems with dissent until well into 1941 as the domestic life and the economy worsened. worsened. However, the Vichy regime, re, regime relied more and more upon the police to maintain order. And when an active uh, resistance began forming in the non-occupied zone, Vichy's responses propelled the fragile government on a downward spiral of repression on behalf of, the, of Nazi Germany from which it would never recover. Initial opposition to the regime was dominated by Freemasons, Socialists and Communists, but soon ordinary French people were, f were forced to take sides, pitting Frenchmen against Frenchmen while British Special Forces Executive, SOE, took the opportunity to recruit 52 agents along the French coast between 1940 and 1942. A new diktat from Vichy in September made men from 18 to 50 year olds and single women from 21 to 35 years old eligible for labour at the state's discretion. Overall, 665,000 Frenchmen were working in Germany at the end of 1943 and more French citizens were employed in German factories than any other national anarchy except Russians. So, um, you can see the Vichy regime was complicit in sending uh, their own uh, countrymen to be literally worked to death for the um, German regime. Uh, when the Germans and Italians invaded a non-occupied zone in, in November 1942, all of France could see that Bataan had uh, failed to protect the nation from its fascist oppressors. To many of the residents of the Outmara team, there was no good reason to um, continue supporting the Vichy regime. Bataan, who had lost his two primary uh, uh, bulwarks against Nazi Germany, namely French colonies with largely in Allied hands, and the French fleet had been scuttled itself at Toulon rather than falling to German control. He had also demonstrated he, that he would um, not carry out the threat most feared by Hitler of defecting to the, ally, uh, to the Allies. He was um, not just a, a puppet regime under the Germans, he was, um, he was basically a believer and he believed in what Hitler was doing. Um, the announcement that Allied forces were in North Africa was followed three days later by the Germans crossing the line of demarcation and entering the former non-occupied zone. As, as, a, as a concession to Mussolini, as well as to conserve his own troops for higher priorities, Hitler permitted seven Italian uh, divisions, uh, amounting 150,000 men, to occupy seven south eastern uh, departments in in, uh, in the entirety, including the Alpmaritime and the Var. And on November 11th, the Italians marched into Nice. So, um, basically, um, Hitler decided that um, the Italians could do what they wanted in the free zone. He didn't particularly want to send German troops there unless he really had to. And um, anyway, the Italians were perfectly happy with us. The Nice were largely unmoved, noting that the troops looked tired and at, at shuffling pace, with, every, with dirty uniforms in a shabby state, with frayed leggings and uh, shoes down at heels, while the officers were well-groomed and elegant, with the whiff of an immoderate use of strong perfume. <laughs> That is, not sure of that, but there's an office, the Italian officer taking a salute of Italian armed forces. And as you can see, these gentlemen here are French uh, officers. I don't know whether they're naval officers or something of that sort. The soldiers uh, whistled at pretty women and pinched her behind whenever possible, with some of them boasting that they were winners. But one Italian officer noted that the French population weighed us, uh, weighed, um, weighed us silently, visibly motivated by a sentiment worse than hatred, contempt. The Italian soldiers were disparagingly referred to as macaronis by the French. 
The population was united in belief that the only undefeated French army had been the one that fought the Italians in June 1940, and that the Bersaglieri, who now arrived with plumes in their hats, would soon depart with the feathers stuck in their backsides. At first, the light touch of the Italian occupiers was a relief from the uh, harsh treatment of the Vichy regime. As political and uh, police pressure eased, as political and police pressure eased, but the Allies now in North Africa shipped no longer docked at Nice with food and provisions. The Italian Navy was initially well provisioned for uh, a price offered the local populace cigarettes and desirables including Italian foodstuffs and, and pasta, but by the outset of 1943 the judicial pipeline from, uh, from Italy had dried up and the Bersaleri turned from small-time businessmen, businessmen to part-time thieves, stealing cauliflowers, potatoes and even petroleum. Larger shipments of watermelons, zucchinis and corn designated for the out-maritime also disappeared. The cost of accommodating Italian forces went well beyond looting. The Italian Armistice Commission initially opposed not promotion in indemnity of 1 billion francs per month. The following June, however, this was increased to 1.5 billion on top of ongoing repara reparations being paid by the French to the right. So you can see, um, uh, apart from food shortages, um, the French were paying a huge amount of money, not just to the Germans, but to the Italians as well. So it was a, a double whammy, if you like. The um, in the spring, the Italian authorities seized wood, vegetables, 23 tonnes per day, and iron is still. In May, they announced a requisition of automobile repair firms, uh, factories making uh, plaster and cement, and a number of bakeries. Several dozen locomotives and thousands of automobiles were seized, along with industrial machinery useful to the Italian war effort, and this simply disappeared across uh, the Italian border. As French resistance to the Italian occupation became more organised and violent, the Italian political priest, the URA, that's O-U-R-A, Organisation for Surveillance and Repression of Anti-Fascism, to be correct, became more active. Created in 1926, it was the forerunner of the German secret police, the Gestapo, who largely modelled their uh, tactics on the, on, on the Italians um, and responded to French sabotage with brutality, uh, uh, with brutality rumoured to be just as vicious as its inf infamous German counterpart. Arrests were often arbitrary, well over 1,300 people were, were questioned by Ura, and 975 were imprisoned or deported including Poles, British, Belgians, Yugoslavs, Italians and Frenchmen. As the Italian occupation progressed, torture by the Ura became more frequent. Prisoners were beaten with fists, clubs and rifles. Despite this, there were 50 attacks against the railroads in out maritime during the three years ending June 44. Not all successful, but the rail line was cut 23 times by local partisans, which delayed troop and immaterial movements between Nice and and uh, Cuneo in Italy, whilst locomotives were blown up at Nice's San Roque depot in, in July 1943. And the appointment of Pierre Laval to the, uh, as Prime Minister of the Vichy regime, that's him here, um, uh, uh, yeah. the appointment of Pierre Laval to the pri as Prime Minister of the Vichy regime and the stationing of Italian troops on French soil strengthened Vichy resolve to be the Reich's number one partner in Europe. So basically they, the Vichy government threw everything in uh, with the Nazis. I mean, there was no going back. In September 1942, the Vauer had authorised several hundred Gestapo to agents to infiltrate a non-occupied zone, although in the outmaritime out mounting the, the Gestapo were already at work. In Cannes, in addition to um, Villa Montfleury, where the Gestapo carried out torture, they also uh, set up operations with the Uber in the Hotel Gallia. And that is the Villa Montfleury. This is in uh, Cannes. And that is the Hotel Gallia. Not, Not still there, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. 
With the growing threat of the Allies in North Africa, Italians began to build defensive works along the Côte d'Azur, including long-range guns, bunkers and blockhouses. Photographs of co coastline were forbidden, and from August 1943, anyone found in possession of a weapon or radio in order to assist the Allies would suffer the death penalty. However, with their Italian allies crumbling at home, the Germans took the opportunity to send the commander-in-chief of Germany's Western Front, Marshal Gert von Rundstadt to Nice, where the Italian commander uh, had requisitioned its uh, finest hotel then and now, the Hotel Negresco, to accommodate the Marshal. So that's uh, von Rundstedt. So uh, to send him down was, was a clear sign that the Germans weren't too happy with what the Italians were getting up to in France. And they were wary of an Allied invasion, so he was sent down to investigate um, how prepared the, uh, def the Italian defences were. Von Rodstedt uh, inspected military preparations and fortifications during a two-day visit at Nice and Cannes and Monton. M meanwhile, two days earlier on July 25th, Mussolini was overthrown. And by mid-August 1933, uh, the Germans engaged in uh, live fire exercises in, in, into the sea, and by the end of the month, they were shipping construction materials uh, by rail into southeastern France. So effectively. Uh, <clears throat> their intention um, anyway um, their intention was really to build the same fortifications that they had um, in northern France to prevent the British invasion there but they really didn't have the time uh, to, to complete it, so they were very much reliant on the Italian, what the Italians had already um, uh, had already defences they had set up, and, and the Germans didn't think they were just up to anything. Um, but anyway, they were stuck with it. Um, the, the Wehrmacht were, were, were poised to react. In non the convoy of Italian artillery waited to depart, while the Italians argued amongst themselves. Two German armoured cars appeared and captured the lot. German units um, captured the, the garrison at Kellenring Caserne in Grass, headquarters of the Italian Second Corps, whilst German units in neighbouring communities took charge of munition depots. And at Cannes, the Germans also had little difficulty in subduing the Italian garrison. Five Italian patrol boats arrived at the sea docks and were seized by the Kriegsmarine, members of the Italian Armistice Commission. Um, seated at the hotels Genève and Mediterranean were also detained. The Germans were not superior in number to the Italian forces or artillery power, but in the absence of um, orders from Rome, where obviously Mussolini had been deposed, uh, General Virgilini, the Italian commander, chose not to organise a defence and conducted an orderly withdrawal. In total, more than 53,000 Italian soldiers were taken prisoners by the Germans, and Italian soldiers in plain clothes were considered to be of an legal status by the, legal status by the Germans, and persons found to be concealed and were subject to the death penalty. So effectively the Germans took the opportunity to um, rid the area of the Italians while there was a vacuum of power. German army intelligence, the Abwehr, uh, operated out of Nice, Grasse, Toulon and, and High Air. While the Gestapo posted men in Montan and Cap and Dean. The Gestapo established its headquarters in the old Hotel Hermitage, or Hermitage with an Allies for intense interrogations at Villa Trinor in the heights, on the heights of Simene, Simenes, Simenes, sorry, a kilometre away. Um, that's the Hotel Hermitage. <coughs> And when the Wehrmacht faced a far greater threat in northern France in 1944, the 715th Infantry Division was redeployed and replaced with the 148th Infantry Division. Uh, centred at Grasse, it was composed mainly by reservists, Austrians and Poles. A French observer described the troops as nearly children with worn uniforms and boots. Magnificent discipline, but with very low morale and a sad and worried look. So, 
although the Germans wanted to defend the South France, they knew an invasion was coming. They just uh, they were too preoccupied on the Eastern Front and obviously Northern France, and that's where they needed their best troops. The troops patronised brothels set up for them in the Nice at the Hotel Metropole and in Cannes at the Hotel de Paris. Now, there were fewer incidents of rape and assault than when <coughs> the Italians were on occupation, and the Germans set about fortifying the coastal defence of the Riviera with more than 100,000 mines and traps, a density of almost 100 devices an acre in anticipation and an allied landing. So these are very sort of low-key defences. They weren't really going to stop a, um, um, you know, a proper organised invasion. Uh, you know, that's barbed wire. These are what they called... Uh, they were tank traps, which the French called uh, Rommel's asparagus. Uh, but you can see, I mean, they're not... You know, they're not really going to stop any certain invasion force. That's... Uh, tank trap defences outside the uh, hotel in Cannes. The Mar sorry, that's the Martinez Hotel in Cannes. That's another view of it. That's French German officers on the, showing themselves on the Cote d'Azur. Um, so, defensive works completely disfigured a, a coastline so below for its natural beauty and tasteful development. A concrete wall rain on the seaside from Cannes. And, and block streets in, entering in the Quai des Etats Unis in Nice. Hundreds of pole mines and concrete te tetradones from Antibes to the Boca protected against tanks debarking from landing craft. And residents nicknamed the pointy sticks cut from trees in the Var and employed it at an angle on shore as Rommel's asparagus. To protect these defences from sabotage, local inhabitants were forcibly evacuated and neighbourhoods around train station, ports and factories working for the Reich were off limits. Despite these restrictions, collaboration with the German occupiers was still prevalent, from collaboratrice horizontal, women who slept with the Germans, to the much despised milice, attired in dark blue uniforms. And these people here are the milice. Um, they were essentially um, a paramilitary unit who assisted the Germans um, the Middle East accepted all those seeking to join being especially attractive to mercenary young thugs and uh, hoodlums from 18 to 23 years old. Leaders were notables, conservatives, strong Catholics and even nobility, all being vehement anti-communists. The Middle East also served as a breeding ground for joining the uh, Waffen SS. I mean, this is them <coughs> sur um, capturing surrendered French resistance, but the Melise had a reputation for not taking prisoners. They probably took these people off and shot them somewhere else. Um, nice. After the German occupation of the Outmaritime, Maritime, the Melise served as a police force of the Germans, even being used to check the reliability of the official French police. They knew their locale better than the Germans and could easily drop on fellow citizens more easily in Gestapo. The Melise were notorious, as I say, for never taking prisoners, and their activity is best described as, as Frenchmen hunting and betraying Frenchmen. So, anyway, just to go back a bit, these are, um, these are sort of holiday snaps, if you like, they're not that clear, but they are in colour, so I thought they, I'd include Matt's German officers join themselves on the Riviera. That's uh, the Nice, and that's some more in Nice. By the end of 1943, the resistance became bolder, with Allied successes <coughs> on battlefields across Europe and North Africa, bringing uh, encouragement. And these became a series of tip, and they became a series of tip for tat killings between them and the Milice. Uh, Allies' aerial bombing of communities along the Côte d'Azur had begun at Cannes on the night, the night of November 19, sorry, November 11, 1943. Twenty RAF Lancasters dropped bombs and incendiary devices for one hour and 35 minutes causing damage to industrial concerns, agricultural facilities and public buildings. Uh, there were 45 civilian deaths and locals referred to it as Black Thursday. The frequency and intensity of carping bombing by American warplanes increased over the south of France and on a raid on May 26, 1944, 
uh, was uh, felt by many Niswar to be the worst of the war, leaving 300 civilians dead and 480 wounded and 100 missing. Uh, so this was a sort of tough period for the um, French locals. They were still uh, obviously under German control and they were being bombed by the Allies as well. Meanwhile, the hunger occupation was a uh, continuing threat to the 580,000 inhabitants of the outline of time who would not survive long in a devastated colony. The, the uh, combination of small yields and a few farms in an, area, in an arid area, together with German repar reparations of 3,500 to 14,000 pounds of fruit and vegetables from local markets every day, was an all too familiar threat to civilians uh, across uh, German occupied Europe. And uh, anyway, so. <laughs> These are the uh, French resistance. So they basically have been encouraged by the Allies' uh, continuing um, progress in the war against the Germans, and also by the fact that uh, you know they were suffering so much under German occupation anyway. I mean, the Allies you know, adding bombing raids to that. There was uh, a good reason to join the resistance. Anyway, added which the Germans surrounded orchards with uh, bar barbed wire and planted landmines, leading to 16 starving inhabitants being killed and another son thing being crippled. The Scarper Milice began maximising opportunities to accumulate wealth before it became too late. The few remaining English, Russians and especially Italians were favourite targets for theft and degradation. The political police harassed and took uh, bribes to release them whilst their accomplices burgled their houses. And during most of the 1930s, only a thousand of, during most of the 1930s, only a thousand or so Jews lived in Nice, but by 1939 that number had five, was five times greater than more than 50,000 Jews uh, passed through the Riviera during the war years. As anti-Semitism took hold in Germany and Austria in the 1930s, Jews were lured to France by speaking of liberalism. 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 Uh, especially by the Third Republic, which was, um, you know, uh, much more um, helpful uh, before uh, Bataan took power. And most evident during the rule of the Front Populaire, Populaire from 1936 to 1938 in France. Baroness of Food, who uh, controlled one of the largest fortunes in Germany, escaped to Cannes. And artists like Max Ernst and Marc Chagall were among thousands of Jews who came to the coast, so that's Max Ernst, and that's Marc Chagall. Ironically, Italy, a fascist state under Mussolini, constituted a gateway for Teutonic Jews. One estimate cites 8,000 Germans and 5,000 Austrian refugees entered Italy from the north and remained in Italy, where anti-Semitism and xenophobia were virtually unknown. Xenophobia, however, was a pillar of the Vichy regime. Its first tenet was to identify and list all Jews in France and then to remove them, um, remove their role in the nation's economic and social life. It intended to prevent the migration of foreign Jews to France and especially into the non occupied zone. So anti Jewish policies were promulgated by Vichy in a succession of laws from July 1942 to December 1942. And only in except in rare cases, it was no longer possible for Jews to be doctors dentists, lawyers, professors, journalists, or actors. <coughs> so very similar to uh, the Nazi regime in Germany. There was a respite for Jews during the, uh, the Italian occupation of November 1942, September 1943, and the Jewish presence would grow exponentially in the Alp Maritime. Uh, Mussolini uh, regime differentiated itself from Nazis in as much as it did not espouse visceral anti-Semitism, but in reality uh, the Jews simply became pawns in the uh, German and uh, Italian rivalry. And in Italy's interve in intervention to block the final solution in south-eastern France was raised at, at uh, meetings held by Mussolini in late 1943 with jo Joachim von Ribbentrop, the German foreign minister, and the Reichs Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, Heinrich Himmel, Him, sorry, with Joachim von Ribbentrop, the Reichsminister of Foreign Affairs, and Heinrich Himmler, Commander-in-Chief of the Gestapo, 
but without concrete results. The Nazis have been wringing their hands over the situation in the Italian zone in southern France almost from its inception. They were concerned that the Italian regime under Marshal Badoglio, this is him, who had succeeded Mussolini, were in collusion with an Italian Jew, Angelo Donati, that's him there, a successful businessman and former banker in Paris who now lived in Nice and who had persuaded the Italian regime to create a passport specifically to convict foreign Jews to enter Italy. And some thousand, some 5,000 copies were quickly printed. The Germans intended to kidnap Donati in Nice and bring him to Marseille to interrogate him. Uh, or more, more realistically, uh, torture him. However, when Donati got uh, premature news of the Italian surrender, he fled to Milan and escaped the clutches of the Germans who had derisively nicknamed him <coughs> the Pope of the Jews. The celebration in his niece, uh, sparked by news of Italy's surrender, did not extend to the Jewish community. The Wehrmacht quickly took control of rail stations and border posts, and the Jews who were held up in Nice's overflowing hotels were easy prey for the Gestapo. Arrests had begun in Cannes hotels on 9th of September 8th and 9th, and the search extended into all the towns and villages along the Côte d'Azur and into the back country. And the man uh, directing the hunt for the Jews in the Alp Maritime was this man, SS Hauptstenfuhrer Alois Brunner, age 31, and who had at one time uh, served as Adolf Eichmann's personal secretary, variously described as puny with an insignificant physique and small mean eyes, he was considered to be outstanding in brutality and arrived in Nice having organised roundups of Jews in, uh, for deportation in Paris, Austria and Greece. He chose as his headquarters the Hotel Excelsior, just a few steps from the main race station in Nice, and that's it there. Not a fantastic position, but it's still in existence and you can stay there. However, with the compliance of the regime, Vichy regime, the participation of the police, national gendarmes and local policemen, uh, sorry, however, without the compliance of the Vichy regime, the participation of the police, national gendarmes and local policemen, the SS has insufficient manpower to carry out their task. The Wehrmacht did not join in the Jewish manhunt. The viciousness of the German roundup coalesced um, uh, the the viciousness of the German roundups coalesced the German population in support of victims of Nazi persecution and was sickened by the sight of Frenchmen taking part in the arrests. So on November 9, 14, 1943, Brunner closed the hotel at Zelsio and headed to Drancy, having uh, concluded that the French police were no longer reliable collaborators in anti Semitic operations. The situation, no doubt, brought on by the Germans failures in the war on the Eastern Front. And deportations from the um, uh, from these fell off sharply after Brunner departed. Large scale roundups became rare and replaced by raids targeted at private homes. The final tally showed 4,200 deported sent from the Alp Maritime to Germany. Of the Jews, only 3% survived. Vichy propaganda assisted by sacrifice Sacrificing foreign Jews, French nationals would be spared. But more than 76,000, approximately 300 Jews in France, the largest population in Europe, were deported to die in Eastern, in, uh, Eastern Europe. It was a stain on French honour that still reverberates today. An invasion of southern France was mentioned in strategic del deliberations among the Allies through, throughout 1943 and 1944, notably at the conferences of Quebec and Tehran. The priorities at these conferences, however, were the offensive already underway in Italy and an eventual land in Europe from England. US military leaders envisaged a three division operation in the south of France, but it soon became clear that demand for ground forces and amphibious aircraft during or after the invasion of, the, of northern France was so great that the operation against Vichy France nicknamed Anvil at this stage, would have to follow rather than take place sim simultaneously with the D-Day landings. Churchill registered the strongest exception to the plan after July 2nd, 1944, when the combined chiefs of staff directed General Wilson to direct a three-division attack complete with 
uh, airborne landings in southern France by August the 15th. Churchill advocated switching one second French, uh, a second French landing in Brittany where he asserted it would play a direct role in support of overlord the D-Day landings. However, the larger southern French ports of Marseille and Toulon had the advantage of being made accessible and without tidal fluctuations. And so Churchill was overruled and General Wilson, US General Wilson received the final order to execute the invasion. Three American invasions Sorry, go back. Three uh, American divisions with amphibious experience were identified for the operation. The 3rd, the 36th and 45th infantry divisions, all veterans were fighting in Italy, and each had three subordinate re regiments comprising of eight to 900 men each. The assault forces would be accompanied, accompanied, accompanied by teams of French officers and NCOs to conduct liaison with the local French population. An estimated 84,000 troops and 12,000 vehicles were expected to go um, ashore on the first day with another 35,000 troops and 8,000 vehicles mainly associated with the French army um, unloading over the next three days. So that's the map of the German dis dispositions uh, throughout France. Um, the planned invasion was really long here, and they were going to take uh, ports of Toulon and Marseille um, by moving along the coast. And that is a map of the general. Uh, what a Scotsman! <laughs> no, no. The, Red, the Red Cross is a German battery. <laughs> these, these were the, uh, you can see here, these, these are the invasion air areas. You know, these were largely not heavily defended. I mean, the ports were. I mean, the reason why they wanted to land there was that, A, it was easier. Less, uh, they expected less opposition. Um, well, the Germans really had all their forces protecting the ports of Marseille and Toulon. And so, the operational concept of Anvil was uh, straightforward to land in southern France, see season develop a major port, and drive northwards up the Rhone Valley to link up with the uh, Allied forces moving into Germany. Allied uh, plan has selected the coastline from Toulon east towards Cannes for its proximity to Toulon and Marseille and the availability of minor harbours that might supplement over the beach uh, supply operations such as Saint Tropez, Saint Maxime and Saint Raphael. The Wehrmacht order of battle had been seriously uh, um, depleted by uh, um, transfer of units to the Normandy front and senior G uh, German commander Army Group G headquartered in Nice had lost, sorry, Arm, yes, Army Group G headquartered in Toulouse had lost four divisions, three infantry and one panzer divisions. And three solid infantry had been replaced by units suffering from battle fatigue on the eastern front and reserve units made up of old men and boys. So really the Germans, as much as they wanted to defend France, really couldn't afford, certainly didn't have the uh, top level troops to defend it. It was... Um, and they had uh, you know, far, far bigger fights, fish to fry. Much of the armour artillery created was uh, equipped, uh, was stripped away uh, as well, when the Germans in Thurman, France, had relied on captured French, Italian, Russian, and Czech artillery, which were all the conventional complicated munitions supply that that entailed. So if we go back, uh, that's a large German gun emplacement. Uh, but you see a lot of these uh, defences are fair, you know, they're there, but they're not. You know, that's a mobile anti-aircraft gun. That's another anti-aircraft gun. But you can see they're not, not what you would consider heavy defences. That's another anti-aircraft gun. Well, that's German officers inspecting uh, the defences. So much of the, as I say, was... Uh, 
was not up to snuff. And the Wehrmacht leadership with, um, under General Oberst von Blaskowitz, the Army Group C commander, also dissatisfied with defences along the Mediterranean. That's uh, General Oberst von Blaskowitz, Johann Bla Blaskowitz, uh, he was uh, dissatisfied with defences along the Mediterranean coast. And pri priority had obviously been given to the Channel and Atlantic coast for construction material and labour. No heavy installations could be uh, expected. The Germans haven't rely on fortifications left by the Italians. Um, um, I think we all know the Germans' view of the Italians. So um, they didn't really regard the defences as very good. Although well, these have been strengthened with uh, some pillboxes, bunkers, tone traps, anti aircraft. Uh, searchlights, radar sounds, and land and sea mines. Blaskovitz regarded these as mere feared field fortifications. The Kriegsmarine was simply limited to a, a single destroyer, eight export, sorry, eight um, uh, eight uh, sorry, six fast merchant vessels and some 30 or more torpedo boats. So um, there again, there was very little <coughs> that they were going to do to prevent a full-scale invasion by the Allies. The Luftwaffe similarly uh, would have 175 long-range bombers, but only 35 fighters available, and they weren't really a factor at all. One advice the Germans had was that because the Mediterranean had tied, underwater obstacles such as concrete pyramids, wooden pilings and mines could not be seen and were not visible for bombing or shell fire. The head of the Western Naval Task Force and commander of the US 8th Fleet Admiral Henry Kent Hewitt was uh, tasked with destroying these defences with underwater demolition teams and radio controlled drone boats carrying high explosive. The Allied invasion fleet was located in the Bay of Napoli and Sicilia and ports on the heel of Italy and comprised of battleships, cruisers, destroyers, and merchant ships. The position at Malta were a carrier task force and gunfire support group consisting one American, one French and four British cruisers plus various destroyers. At Orlean where transports for the French Army's Division and 2nd and 4th Moroccan in Infantry and Mounted Divisions along with supply ships and escorts in more 850 ships were to be deployed. So I mean this is a serious invasion force. Allied aircraft apportioned their bombing to the fortified industrial port as at Set. Marseille-Toulon, Marseille -Toulon, the Cap Cavalier, Anthea uh, coastline and Genoa. Bombers were also sent to destroy bridges in the Rome Valley that they could use by, by the Germans to send reinforcements. So basically they were going to uh, <coughs> stop the Germans, seal the Germans uh, you know, where they were in their defensive positions. Um, the code word Anvil had by this time become undoubtedly compromised and on August the 1st was renamed Operation Dragoon. The campaign targeted against the French area promised important um, uh, paybacks for American strategists. It would ensure engaged German troops and deny their redeployment when the Reich was fighting three major fronts, Russia, Normandy and Italy. An induction of sizable French um, formations into combat will be welcome support for the Allied Allied armies against Hitler and the drive to Berlin. Mist and fog obscured the Mediterranean coast at daybreak on August the 5th, 1944, and devout Catholics would know it was Assumption Day, whilst others knew it as Napoleon's birthday. The Allied air attack began at 5.50 p.m. and the naval shelling began an hour later and finally stopped after 16,000 shells and 74 tons of explosives had softened up the German defences. And that is the, uh, we'll give you an, an indication of the size of the inflation fleet, of the invasion fleet anger, uh, situated off the coast of France, southern France. Landing for the assault trucks was 28 miles across and divided into three invasion areas. Alpha beaches to the west at Cape Cavalier and Pompelon to south of Saint Tropez. Delta beaches out of east of San Maxime in Bourgogne Bay, Bourgogne Bay and Camel beaches above outside San Rafael. In a fleet gathering along the Riviera with the USS Catechism, sorry, Cat 
yes, Katakin. That is the uh, Allied commanders with uh, Admiral Hewitt, Generals Patch and Trusset, and French Admiral André Le Mornier, whilst on the destroyer HSM Kim HMS Kimberley, Winston Churchill observed landing through his binoculars and with his trademark cigar clenched in his jaw. That is General Patch. That is uh, Admiral Le Mornier on the, on the far right. Thankfully, German opposition on the beaches was uh, light. Staff Sergeant Audie Murphy. That's Audie Murphy. Some, some of you may know Audie Murphy. He was a big American film star after the war. But he was one of the most decorated American soldiers during the war. He fought the campaigns in Italy and the south of France and elsewhere. Um, so he was the real deal. Um, so, so uh, staff, so, staff sergeant Audie Murphy on the 15th in the 15th regiment later became a Hollywood action hero. Encountered a group of krauts in a series of foxholes. He Germans. <laughs> yes. Otherwise known as Germans, yeah. He, he killed them with his carbine before running out of ammunition, seizing a machine gun from a traumatised squad of GIs. Murphy moved forward again but was soon driven to ground by enemy fire. However, the Germans soon uh, waved a white flag, but when Murphy's buddy stood up, he was shot instantly by the Germans. Upon this, Murphy went berserk, throwing a grenade into a German machine gun emplacement. He raped the crew with fire from his carbine until they were all dead. For all this, he would receive the Distinguished Service Cross. As I say, he, you know, he, he wasn't um, decorated just for that. There's various other actions as well. And I say, that's the um, Allied invasion fleet. There was also a paratroop invasion further inland. The idea was to come back in towards the coast and attack the Germans from behind. Uh, that's, that's Allied landings along San Rafael and San Maxim. And you can see the beaches are fairly <coughs> gentle, they can just, there's very little opposition, they can just roll up to them and, and, and unload their tanks and vehicles quite comfortably. And you see there again, they get very very close to the coastline, the beaches. And that's more troop landings. A bit like beaches in recently. Yes, there you go. <laughs> that's, that's socially distanced. <laughs> in other instances, Vermont soldiers laid down their arms rather than fight, and the American troops were able to push on beyond the beaches, encountering just occasional roadblocks, sniper fire and scattered to uncoordinated ambush. The only major holder was a camel red sector at the head of the Gulf de Frejou. The Germans, recognising its importance, uh, had embedded a formidable array of coastal defences and the bombardment by 93B24 liberators and constant use of minesweepers had difficulty quelling them. Eventually landing was switched to Camel Green Beach where 142, 142nd Division Regiment joined up with 143rd to clear Frejou and San Rafael respectively in lively street combat and securing the airfield at Frejou. While the combatants flowing ashore were virtually all American, they were feast a force of 97,000 troops. A mixture of GIs and British were preparing to land uh, 10 to 12 miles inland of beaches to prevent besieged German forces escaping um, into the back country and to settle and seize German positions that provide um, re reinforcements to these positions. The first airborne task force was led by Robert T. Federer, a West Pointer who at the age of 37 had become the youngest Major General in the US Army. At the end of the war, having been wounded eight times, he would earn the, the title of the most shot at and hit general in American history. <laughs> in one attack, the airborne forces came upon the headquarters of Brig Brigadier General Ludwig Beringer at Dragajan. This is him <coughs> here with an American officer looking over him. Um, 
Norman Berenger de Dragadin, a military governor of the VAR. So he's quite a senior commander, as well as the staff of the um, 17th, German 17th Corps. Seizing Berenger and other officers, the paratroopers seized far, five large burlap sacks full of German and French currency, plus barrels of beer, cognac and wine. The, the, <laughs> the GIs threw handfuls of money at astonished civilians as they moved through the town. And the German forces were caught somewhat on the hop, although they fully expected an allied assault. Uh, their intelligence had informed them that it was more likely that the Italian port of Genoa, or Genoa, sorry, some 100 miles east. So although they expected, um, they fully expected an invasion, it wasn't a surprise. <coughs> they miscalculated where it was going to take place. And on August 17, soldiers of three American divisions across the beaches of France were on their way inland, having taken over 1,000 German prisoners. They would soon march eastward across the area in what was euphemistically called the, Ch the Champagne campaign. Also during the Allied attack were the French forces. For them, it was about <coughs> it, it was to redeem national esteem rather than the Allies' desire to open up a second front that was important. These included <coughs> many black Africans from French colonies, many who had never before set foot on French soil, but who still regarded France as their homeland and therefore worth fighting for. Too long, as it is today, France's most important naval centre. Uh, in 1942, the French neighbours scuttled this flotilla their rather than have it fall into the hands of the Germans. It was the most heavily defended point on the southern French coast, and Hitler had ordered it and the Port de Marseille to be defended to the last man and the last cartridge. So the Germans fully realised that these ports uh, were going to be a major advantage to the Allies if they were lost. The Battle of Toulon would be the fiercest and most costly of combat clashes of the um, encounters between Allied and German forces in some in southeastern France. The two French divisions attached via the coast road that ran through Hyère, the southernmost Riviera resort that had been very popular with the English upper classes at the turn of the century, although these had largely gone at the start of the war. The French commanders had to be mindful of a battery of 340 uh, naval cannon at Fort saint mandrier adjacent to the court with a reach of 21 miles. Nicknamed Big Woody by Allied gunners, Two of its four guns had been sabotaged by French workers, and the two functioning woodies were put over action by a French and US battleship. Heavy fighting ensued, aided by Allied warships firing more than 7,500 shells at the German defences. Despite well organised German counterattacks, the Allied forces prevailed. French forces lost 2,700 sorry, 2,700 troops killed, including 100 officers. German losses were numbered in untold thousands, plus 17,000 men taken prisoner. So uh, it was a major victory, to, really, with what you would describe as minimal losses by the Allied forces, which were mainly French. <coughs> the Germans um, lost a lot of people there. If Toulon was Western Europe's greatest naval port, Marseille was France's biggest shipping port. In 1944, Marseille was also France's second largest city, below the 600,000 inhabitants. Its tally, tally was, an, um, sorry, it, uh, it was an international crossroad. It truly was an international crossroads with a strong North African tension. And since 1933, uh, 1932, it had uh, sheltered economic and political refugees from Germany, Italy, Poland, and other Eastern European countries, so, uh, plus many Jews fleeing from persecution in Belgium and Holland. So it was a melting pot on a huge um, uh, uh, mixed population, which uh, the Germans didn't really control, though they were technically in charge of it. The German defence of the city comprised a garrison of 20,000 troops, 5,000 seamen who manned the coastal artillery, and 12,000 soldiers. Um, of various quality of Volksdeutsch, which basically means old men and boys, uh, from various Eastern European countries under Nazi rule. They were ordered to hold the city without hope of air cover, naval support or ground relief. So uh, effectively it was an impossible task. Um, 
General, Hans, General Major Hans Shaver had arrived in March to organise the defence of the city and he was fresh from the Eastern Front where he had been uh, seriously wounded, this is him. Uh, he had no appreciation of the civil unrest in Marseille after 21 months of German occupation, stirred by deportation to concentration camps and general and economic malaise. German intelligence, es intelligence estimated that the city might contain as many as 80,000 rebels, um, many secretly uh, armed by Allied uh, agents. The French forces were th the 3rd Algerian Infantry Division and the 2nd Mo Moroccan Infantry Division. The Moroccans had been sent off to battle after touching French soil for the, the same day. Their tabers, their tabers, as they were called, were colourful troops who had the habit of wearing the ears of opponents <laughs> over the coming battle while, while dressed in tin pith helmets and what resembled golf trousers. <laughs> After vicious fighting, the German st strongholds protecting the sea fell one by one and Marseille surrendered 36 hours after Toulon. So you can see um, <coughs> both of these major ports fell really quite quickly. The German capitulation was signed on the hood of a jeep after a last minute problem erupted when a German officer carrying the surrender document stepped on a landmine. I mean, the Germans put so many mines around that and they didn't even know where they were half the time. And, um, General Major Schaefer turned over 10,000 prisoners along with considerable material. French military losses at Marseille numbered 1,400 killed and wounded, almost half of them Moroccan. The Germans suffered uh, 5,500 killed and 7,000 taken prisoner. Mine, opera mine sweeping operations began immediately to clear channels into the port, and more and more supplies were being discharged into the walls of Marseille and Toulon. By the end of September, 380,000 troops, 306,000 tons of cargo, <laughs> and almost 70,000 vehicles and 18,000 tons of gasoline had been landed. The Germans had planned for a naval defence of the food ports, but the Allies attacked from the side. And, this, and thus most of the German coastal batteries had not fired a shot. And that is one of the German coastal batteries or defences. But they were all aimed to defend the ports from the, towards the sea, not from the, not from the land. In Cannes, the Cannes, I believe, received this, that, uh, that something was afoot when at 11pm of August 14th, the droning sound of repeated air squadrons could be heard overhead, followed by a series of explosions. Destinations persisted throughout the night and bombers triggered, uh, Ill, uh, sorry, targeted Ill de Le Perrin in the bay in front of Cannes where German batteries were set up and the heights of the Croix de Guerre and Mougan, again targeting uh, gun emplacements. The next day, the Allied Navy, including the French battleship Lorraine, began firing. 300, we began firing 340 millimetre shells at the blockhouse at the Balm, Palm Beach Casino on the Cap de la Croisette. The German occupiers of Cannes responded by blowing up the Quai Saint Pierre, running alongside the west side of the port. Meanwhile, a more sinister uh, response emanated from the Gestapo, who, utilising Villa Montfleury in a residential quarter for interrogation and torture, the Gestapo burned piled up files and burnt them, and then assembled a dozen prisoners in an underground cell and shot, although they released one woman, possibly informant, whilst one man managed to escape in the confusion. The Allied naval force continued to look at barrage of shells at military installations while Cannes remained under caution. The Hotel de Ville, which is basically where the uh, local, mus mus the, uh, local council and governance of Cannes was uh, situated, Battle. suffered extensive damage, added numerous villas with some civilian casualties. The 509th Parachute Infantry Battalion Commander looked at the city of Cannes from a pr prominence and tried to figure out a way to attack it. Herbert Matthews of the New York Times joined him and said, you see that building over there? That's the Hotel Carlton. It's not only the best hotel in France, it's the best hotel in the world. I'll be much obliged if you didn't do anything to wreck it. <laughs> that, wow. that is the... Um, so the Hotel Carlton, very well known, obviously, from the Cannes Film Festival, that's where all the top stars um, stay, um, and obviously still, still in business. 
The Germans had already withdrawn from behind the Gestapo headquarters in the Hotel Gallia, and the resistance knew the Germans planned to destroy the hotel as well. Palace of Justice, Records Bureau, the Post Office, and all the hotels along the Croisette, including the Carpenter with high explosives. Minikoni, the resistance leader, sent a message to Colonel Eric Schneider, uh, asking him to resist, uh, desist from this pointless devastation in return for allowing his men to withdraw without opposition. Schneider agreed, showed Minikoni the master switch in the cellar of the Hotel Splendid whilst the Germans marched out of Cannes in the early hours of August the 24th. Schneider was ex executed four days later by the Germans in Nice by a firing squad for dereliction of duty. Once the resistance had uh, secured the city, the Americans were riding the triumphal parade for the city in jeeps and atop tank destroyers. One platoon leader describing the scene, the people were really joyful. Tears were running down their faces. Girls were kissing everybody. People were throwing flowers at us. Just the way it's supposed to be. And that's the <coughs> Canoir celebrating their um, um, release from German occupation. August the 24th was also the date Antibes was uh, um, relieved. Although not in a manner often envisaged by Allied, often envisaged by Allied troops, but by a fait accompli by the French resistance and a show of force. One after another, German soldiers surrendered and military depots fell into the hands of the resistance. There was only one serious counterback by a column of German soldiers and the police, which was comfortably repelled, yielding 11 prisoners and one dead. The news of the Allied land is quickly spread, bringing joy to the populace, but unfortunately sealed the fate of 21 inhabitants incarcerated in Nouvelle prison, prisons, all members of the resistance, including three women, and all malnourished and disfigured by torture. As in Cannes, the Gestapo executed them by machine gun fire to ensure there were no survivors to tell, tell, tell the tale of their crimes. Despite the disruption of the, the Gestapo and the release from the city, there remained a garrison of 1,500 German soldiers, deprived by approximately 350 members of the resistance. There then began street warfare, the resistance attacking German vehicles, collecting pistols, grenades, and even a full-size machine gun, which greatly enhanced their firepower. The Wehrmacht stronghold on the chateau high above the old city opened up with machine guns and mortars. The German commander, Field Commandant Nickelman, contacted the prefecture of Nice to warn him that he would only order the garrison's withdrawal if the resistance uh, ceased fire, otherwise he would launch firebombs. He, he received no such reply and firing continued. A Wehrmacht colonel carrying plans for the withdrawal from Nice was captured and those were conveyed to the American headquarters in Grasse. By mid-afternoon, Germans in convoys on, on foot and, in, and could be seen on the upper, middle and lower caniches heading towards the Italian border, firing as they went for, uh, for complete, although complete withdrawal and complete withdrawal was uh, received, uh, the order for complete withdrawal was received by 6.30pm. Uh, Two hours later, the Allied fleet began shelling the blockhouses along the promenade at Anglais, and the last Germans descended from the heights into Nice, firing defensively as they left. The Germans lost 25 dead and 105 prisoners, uh, plus four Italian black shirts who were executed. The resistance lost 27 killed and 280 wounded, but by midnight, the Nice Royal were masters of their own city once more. That's the, uh, <coughs> the American troops marching into Nice, uh, being greeted by the Nice, well, although, you know, effectively, uh, apart, from, apart from Allied firepower, it had been mostly the uh, resistance who had uh, won the day. <clears throat> in Monaco, the Germans had headquarters in infantry, had headquartered, uh, sorry, that is German prisoners being uh, booked at, Mar at San Tropez. In Monaco, the Germans had headquartered an infantry division followed by a motorised division and uh, reserve units consisting largely of Poles and Austrians. The Gestapo released political prisoners taken by the Italians, the previous occupiers, and replaced them with individuals targeted by them, namely resistance members and Jews. The ruler of Monaco, Prince Louis II, seen here, had managed to retain the, the tiny state's independence throughout the war. It would always look to France as its protector, even after France was an occupied state. And perhaps more importantly, he managed to keep the baccarat tables occupied 
and the roulette wheel spinning at the Monte Carlo Casino. The Germans were interested in utilising Monaco's independent and independence and registered companies there for the purchase, for the purpose of affecting legal war commerce. And they were also interested in establishing a bank there to protect wealth that they confiscated or requisitioned from the Jews <laughs> across occupied Europe. And also the huge indemnity payments being paid to them from France of 220 million francs a day. Prince Louis could not have been more hospitable. He signed his name Ludwig I von Monaco and spoke perfect German to the new German consul. Louis had been born in Baden-Baden. The Reich responded in kind. Monaco would be treated as a friendly country like Franco-Spain. They would not have to pay the usual cost of an occupied state to the Reich. The Germans finally established a bank in Monaco in the summer of 94, so summer of 1944 with 100 million francs of capital, whilst carefully omitting references to its senior Nazi clientele and the fact that the Reichsbank was underwriting the bank. Monaco soon became the home port for Germans, ta German tankers, minesweepers and patrol boats, while barbed wire minefields and blockhouses were put in place. And that's the uh, German officers strolling around Monaco. Monaco was a hotbed of provocateur, pro provocateurs and agents from all countries with a stake in the war, whilst the Gestapo went about their bloody business of targeting resistance members and Jews. As fighting along the river air from Operation Dragoon Junior, Allied aircraft bombed Monaco on August 27th, and the next morning the Allied fleet began shelling the heights above the principality. The German army evacuated Monaco on the night of September the 2nd, and as they prepared to leave, they dynamited strategic military works to protect their uh, retreat towards the Italian border. So, in conclusion, um, in conclusion, <coughs> Operation Dragoon was, had been an overwhelming success, certainly for the Allies. These are uh, American troops relaxing after uh, the invasion in the uh, Eden Rock swimming pool, which is a very exclusive uh, hotel today, even today. Uh, they're relaxing there in, in the pool and they're capped on tea. And, um, it had led to a rapid advance, taking 50, 50, 57,000 enemy prisoners and opening harbour facilities capable of handling well over half a million tonnes of supplies for months, per month, increasing, including provisions for 900,000 Allied soldiers and driven the Germans out of France with a relatively small number of 2,500 dead uh, US, US troops and 4,000 French casualties. And this is a German soldier receiving a bottle of wine from a young girl. For the French, it had opened up wounds that would take a long time to heal, and the problems from which still reverberate today. First, there was the settling of scores between the victorious French and those who had collaborated with the Italian and German Germans during the occupation, but worse than that was the treatment of thousands of French Jews by the own countrymen from southern France to the gas chambers of Eastern Europe from whence they would never return. And the guild of the French nation that would forever be associated with it. And that concludes. You'll be glad to be uh, any questions? <laughs> uh, very good. Uh, Charles? Uh, yes, uh, Her General Essex, uh, if you were visiting the German officer of the Riviera in need of a hotel suite, and uh, uh, I'm just wondering which, which hotel would you choose to stay at? Uh, well, um, yeah, so I mean, in, in, in Nice. Well, Prussia, there are a few. Yeah, yeah well, in Nice, the, the headquarters of the Italians was. Uh, Nearly Gresco, I mean, that's still the best hotel in Nice. Um, the one bar's rubbish. Is it right? <laughs> well, it's still the most renowned hotel in Greece, so I think that, you know, German officers will stay uh, what there. What would you be your second choice, presuming that her General Bunty had got there first? <laughs> <laughs> well, now the jacuzzi. <laughs> in Nice. <laughs> 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 uh, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not so familiar with the hotels. I mean, Cannes, I could name you all hotels in Cannes. I mean, there are obviously lots of nice hotels in Nice, but I, 
the Gresco just brings them on. I mean, you know, if you're talking about all, all of these places that they, the Germans stayed, I mean, they basically stood all there. They're all still at the top of the hotel. I mean, obviously the Carlton and Can, um, Martinez is still there. What else? Are there? Two others. Um, so yeah. More questions? This is fascinating, but sort of often the, the D-Day landings are, are so much in the public eye, even yeah. today. And I sort of, this operation, I didn't really know much about it, so very no. fascinating. Thank you. Well, I, th I think the reason... Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. sorry. Uh, well, so I was to finish off there. I, I mean, the reason for that, as I, I said in the beginning of the piece, is that uh, I don't think the French really want, want you to know about it. I mean, I think they're quite, they still feel quite guilty about it. I mean, there's been films about it, um, uh, you know, about the French treatment of Jews. I mean, in fact, effectively, the Vichy regime yeah. was basically doing what the Germans would have done. Yeah, um, yeah. They, they, they deported a lot of French. Jews, um, obviously to their deaths. I mean, you know, it's something that still reverberates today. In French politics, you've got, uh, you know, you've got the extremes of politics. You've got French, you know, the Communist Party is still very strong in France, was during that period. And, you know, the Vichy regime was obviously far right and it was basically in sympathy with the Germans. Question is to do with the Vichy France. Um, just as a refresher, uh, do you know what currency they decided to opt in? Do they consider the franc or do they opt for another currency? Yeah, I think. Well, they're still, yes, yeah, still using francs because yeah. they were paying the Germans in francs. Um, so yes, I mean the franc was. Uh, did they get the money? Yeah. Okay. Just, just pause. Yeah. One of the advantages of lockdown was uh, the opportunity to. Uh, <laughs> watch extensive programming that uh, was made available to people to view. And uh, 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 it was a highlight, when one has time to his hands, is to watch the World War. Yes. And uh, um, yeah. there's very few people who can compare with uh, Lord Olivier with regard to providing a comprehensive analysis <laughs> of the Second World War. But I think I can say without fear of, without fear of contradiction, but uh, uh, we have a master amongst our... Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but it is! is. <laughs> well done, Alison! So wonderful! Well, so spectacular! That's John Gilligan once said to me. Very, today. very kind. I, I have to say, a lot, a lot of it is getting regurgitated. <laughs> oh, no, say no more. Say no more. Say it back. Say no more. Very anyway, so very good. Very good. Very good. Very good. Very good. Very good. Landlord, where's the landlord? It's, uh, it's, uh, we're out. Uh, we're, 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 we're yeah, yeah, we may need, uh, you know, we may need the small thing. Oh, 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 goodbye oh, to all of you at the thing at home.